Shalom and greetings, everybody. Christian here from Love Israel in Australia. Welcome to today's program. I'm excited that you're joining us here today, and I pray that you will be blessed with today's teaching. Today's theme is Yeshua, Jesus as Judge, a very important topic, uh, especially in the concept of the last days. So once again, I'd like to welcome Baruch all the way from Israel. Welcome, Baruch. Great to see you again, Baruch. Nice to see you as well, Christian. It's, um, it's, it's wonderful that we can use technology for uh, teaching God's word. It's a uh, it's wonderful tool to have. Um, as I said in my introduction, we'll be uh, discussing a very important theme. I mean, all themes are important when it comes to biblical teachings. But I think that um, I want to say from the beginning that while we're going to talk about Yeshua, Jesus as judge, um, I often get a lot of people coming to me and saying, well, you know, yes, but God is love and Jesus is love. And, and I want to say right from the outset that I agree with that 100%. I mean, the, the scripture that's so used around the world that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So from that aspect, of course, God is love. Uh, Yeshua is love. He, he paid the ultimate sacrifice. So there's no debating that. But unfortunately, uh, not in a lot of churches, people aren't teaching that uh, Yeshua uh, is also a judge and he will be judging the nations, which is very important. So thank you for your time today. And we're going to go through quite a few scriptures and we're going to open up quite a few of these scriptures. So um, thank you again for your time. And if you're ready, let's begin. Let's begin. Wonderful. So I'm just going to share the screen as we always do so that people watching can have access to the actual uh, scriptures that we'll be looking at. And we'll kick it off right now. So I'd like to begin with John 5, 22. Once again, this is the New King James Version. But of course, Baruch, you'll be able to do a you know, a word for word translation or any other comments that you feel are appropriate for each scripture. So for the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. Well, first of all, we need to realize that that it is Yeshua, the one who died for us, as you pointed out, the one who loves us. So he's the judge. And if we're in a covenant total relationship with him through the gospel, we can feel secure, we can have assurance. But one of the things that people neglect is always to, to pay close attention to how Messiah, how our Savior is being referred to. And, and here he's called the Son. And one aspect of the Son is that he brings honor, he brings glory to his Father. And so he's going to judge in a way that in the end, God is glorified. And what you were talking about a few minutes ago, this whole concept of judgment, many people within, within Christianity want to remove it from our, our discussion. And the seriousness of God's judgment is seen in the cross. Yes, that man manifests his love, but it shows us the degree that God is willing to go to punish sins. And if one rejects the cross, then they're going to experience God's severe judgment upon them. And the key to any aspect of judgment is Messiah. You receive him, he takes that judgment from an eternal condemnation standpoint upon himself for us. If you reject that, then you receive that eternal condemnation upon you. But the cross tells us that God is serious about judgment and we shouldn't just cast it off like, it's no longer relevant. So many of the scriptures that we're going to look at points to his return and his call at that time to judge. Correct. Thank you. Um, I think a carry on from that scripture is John 5, 27, which reads, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. We see over and over in the, in the scripture that we're going to look at and many, many others as well, is that judgment is necessary for the kingdom of God to be established. One aspect of judgment is setting things in order. 
and that order is not uh, what what this individual wants or that individual wants. It's always related to God's will and a, a text that we'll go to come to shortly has to do with the righteousness. God's judgment is going to bring about righteousness and there's an inherent relationship between the righteousness of God and his standards, his instructions, his commandments. And that's why when we look at the millennial kingdom, we, we have that familiar verse Torah, and the law goes forth from Zion. Zion, and I, I really don't believe there's much debate about this among, among biblical scholars, that Zion is related to, to the kingdom, specifically the, the millennial kingdom, and the standards that God's going to use to, to rule over that kingdom is his commandments. They manifest. They're not an instrument that makes righteous but they are, are instruments that define what righteousness is. So God's judgment is going to bring about a righteous character to this world, which will become his kingdom and its Messiah that's going to ensure that. So he's coming and we need to remember coming with a rod of iron. Mm. So his judgment is, is sincere. It is real. He's coming, as you pointed out, with all authority, a, a God the Father authority, which he has inherited. And that should cause us to, to look at things very soberly and examine ourselves to see if we're, we're demonstrating his righteousness in our life. Absolutely. Thank you. The next scripture we'll look at is also in John 9, 39. And Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world that those who do not see may see, and that those who may be made blind. Uh, once again, a very powerful scripture that um, I know you will touch on a little bit more now, but um, it, it, the emphasis on Yeshua coming as a judge and for judgment. And giving us a perspective, this whole statement comes within a very important context, the healing of a blind man one who was born blind. And the, the emphasis here is that he speaks to the world in our natural condition, the way we're born, we are spiritually blind. And it's only the revelation of God through Messiah that can give us a, a kingdom perspective, a heavenly perspective for seeing things. So he says here, for judgment. Now that's a, a mighty statement. Good. He's come into the world for judgment and again individuals that just discount that and think that judgment and i know many there's one very well-known pastor in america and he emphasizes so frequently about he's gospel centered and he teaches primarily out of the four gospels now of course he uses other scriptures and such but he says i want to emphasize the teachings of of christ and that's that's fine but he never deals with Messiah's call to repentance, never deals with, with judgment, never deals with the conviction of sin. But when we look at the scripture, we see that primarily it says, for, for judgment I have come to set things in order and to manifest his judgment is going to manifest the righteousness of God that's going to bring clarity. And that's why this healing of, of a blind man is going to bring a divine clarity into the world. And that clarity relates to God's expectations, what he expects his created world to be. And unfortunately today, we're very, very far away from this world being anywhere close to what God has called it to be, why he's created it. And that's why there's going to be some serious change. And it's his judgment that's going to be that catalyst to bring about a righteous change. Correct. Thank you for that. And also, I think you touched on this a little bit. And it's not only that gentleman that you mentioned that's teaching all that, but there are so many others that are teaching and neglecting to teach this subject, which, in my humble opinion, is, is really crippling the church because they're not being prepared they're not being led into repentance. I mean, even John the Baptist always said, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Um, there's so little emphasized on those two things, repentance and that 
judgment that will come. So uh, I totally agree with you 100% with what you said there. So we're going now to move to Acts uh, in chapter 10, verse 42. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who has ordained by God, who was ordained by God, to be the judge of the living and the dead. Very important. Well, again, we're, we see this having end time significant. Mm. Whenever the resurrection is mentioned, the living and the dead to judge them, there's a, a connection to a resurrection unto God's judgment. And both in this verse and here, he's, he, the scripture, Peter, of course, is, is preaching, revealing truth to Cornelius. The first time that the gospel is taken to a Gentile, and this is a paradigm for the truth going forth, not just to one, but, but to the nations. But, but in your translation, it has a word ordained. And I believe in the, in the next scripture we're going to look at, also from the book of Acts, mm -hmm. we see this word ordained. Yes. And that's a pretty heavy word. People want to really build things on that word. Uh, God has preordained and, and things such as those lines. What I like to say is that this word in the Greek language is a word orizo. Now, there's two words that are relevant here, orao and orizo. They both come from the same root. The ending, whether it's izo or ao, those two suffixes are just two different types of verb. But the root means, in this case, to see. Now, I think in English, when we hear ordain something and simply to see something, it's, it's a very different different understanding when we hear those two different words, to see right. yes. and to ordain. Yes. But, but what's happening here, this word orizo means to, to have a pattern and to match something to that pattern. So there's an objective, there's a, a goal, there's, there's a, a achievement that one is wanting to uh, bring about. And what it says here, when it speaks about that, that Messiah was ordained by God, what it's saying here is that God the Father looked and saw that his son reached the objectives. He, was, he fulfilled the pattern. What God envisioned a judge to be, Messiah fulfills that. So when it says he ordained him, it is a confirmation that Yeshua perfectly completely, fully, is going to mediate the judgment to produce the, the objectives of God. And he's going to do that. And the living and the dead implies those who are, are spiritually right to God. A covenant is an instrument of life. Those who reject a covenant, they are experiencing and will experience eternally spiritual death. So he's coming, no one, this judge that God has, has saw as fitting to be the judge, no one is going to escape his judgment. So many times people, I'm not interested in religious things, spiritual things. Uh, I just like to live my life the way I want to live it. Well, everything that you do is going to be measured and put against the standards of God. And it's going to be Messiah who paid that ultimate price for forgiveness. And if you reject that, then you're going to, to find the consequences of that disobedience eternally. Correct. And touching on that scripture that uh, basically is along with what you just said in Acts 17, 31, where he says, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. That's what you touched on earlier. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Here again, resurrection shows that he came into the world for a kingdom purpose. The resurrection, you know, when we're recording this a few weeks ago, many people in the world celebrated the birth of Messiah. Mm -hmm. Now, the birth of Messiah is important. We should study it. We should share it. But never are we commanded to make it into a festival. But when we look at the resurrection, this is what the scripture far more 
uh, lifts up, exalts, emphasizes is his resurrection. And that's because it's not birth, but resurrection that relates to, to the kingdom. And I really like one of the aspects that, that we see in this, this uh, verse. And that is where it says, he's going to judge the world, meaning no one's going to be excluded. No one's going to, to be exempt in righteousness. Right. That tells us that he's coming with a very different mindset than the world. The world's not pursuing. The world's not interested in righteousness. They reject the standards of God. But nevertheless, he's coming. And when it says at the end here, has given us assurance, that is that the payment has been paid in full, that his work was sufficient. So I like the word assurance so very much. And, and going back to the context of the previous verse, it's all about the remission, the forgiveness, the redemption that brings about that forgiveness of our sins. So it's so significant that when God speaks about judgment, the severity of it, there's, there's usually in, in the few verses before or after a mention of how God has made provision so that we can stand in his judgment that we can, can be brought through his judgment, but it's only by this provision. So he's the judge, but he's paid the price so that his judgment does not consume us, but his judgment is going to affirm us because of this covenantal relationship we have. Thank you. Thank you for that. Moving on to the next scripture in Romans, chapter 2, verse 16. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Just before I hand over to you, Baruch, you touched on something and it's also, it also it correlates well with this scripture that always touches my heart is that all of us, all of us, no matter who you are, the day will come where we'll need to stand before Christ. So, you know, I always think back to that scripture that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is the Lord. Now, I always, that's why I encourage people to accept that free gift of salvation by bowing your knee to Yeshua as Lord and Savior of your life, because that day will come that you will need to stand before him. And I'd much rather bow my knee now to him than not bowing my knee to him as receiving as my Lord and Savior and then having to deal with eternal consequences. So just handing over to you now, Baruch, with Romans 2, 16. That, that is such an important concept, what, what you shared, and the benefits for doing that now. Everyone's going to do that. Bow the knee and confess. Everyone will do that. But the question is, am I going to do it in this body while I have breath and make that right decision and have eternal blessing and being in the presence of God and knowing fellowship with him for eternity? Or am I going to reject it now? And when I do it the next time, or when I do it the first time, but it's going to be after my death, it'll be at the great white throne judgment. People are going to acknowledge him as the king of kings, lord of lords, but it's not going to be for salvation. It's going to be acknowledge him prior to this eternal judgment that's placed upon them. But going to Romans chapter 2, uh, Romans, there, there were many Jewish people in, in Rome. But in this section, he's speaking primarily, if one checks the context, he's, he's preaching here to, to Gentiles. And when he says the, the secrets of men, he's talking about the conscience, those things that are within. And in the previous verse, I believe verse 14, if I'm not mistaken, this is verse 16, but two verses earlier, it talks about the Gentiles that, that were not given the law. But, but they have a law, the phrase is a law unto themselves. And most theologians see this as a conscience that every human being, we by our conscience can discern to a certain degree right and wrong. And, and even the, the Gentiles that never were given the law formally, if they go against their conscience, they're just as guilty, just as disobedient as one who has been given the law, but has rejected it. 
So it speaks about all people, whether they be Jew or Gentile, whether they have formally received the law and have knowledge of the scripture or not, all are going to be viewed as guilty because God knows he can judge the secret thoughts. He knows that the conscience tells me not to do that, but I do it anyway. So I'm a sinner. I am, am a, a candidate for his judgment. But he's come into the world. And notice in verse 16, it talks about according to my gospel. Yes. The gospel works even for those who do not know all the, the laws of God. The gospel also can redeem us from the, the times that we have violated our conscience, that, that gift that God's provided to all humanity to some degree to know right or wrong. So what he's saying here is that the gospel's relevant. Some were saying the gospel was for Jewish people only. He's making the point the gospel's relevant for all humanity. And it's sad today, it's almost like it's flipped that, that so much of the world thinks the gospel's only for the nations and not for Israel. The Bible is, is saying it's for all people. Mm. It was given first, just like the Torah was to the Jewish people, but the gospel is for all people in order it can redeem us from that those secret acts of disobedience that maybe no one else knows, God knows them. And it shows how merciful he is as well. Amen. Next scripture is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. And we touched on this not, not long ago, but we want to look at this scripture a little bit more. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, which I think is also very important to touch on that. Uh, I mean, Yeshua, Jesus is such a perfect judge that, he will also reward for the good deeds that believers have done. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Over to you, Bill. This is exactly the primary context here. And what you say, is, it's correct. There's a, a judgment of non-believers. Ultimately, that's going to be that great white throne judgment. There will not be one believer, not one, that goes to the great white throne of judgment. Everyone who appears there, their name is not written in the book of life. They have no hope whatsoever. This scripture, as another scripture that I believe we'll look at later on, is more emphasizing the believer that we're going to go and have a judgment. But that judgment for us is not where we're going to spend eternity. That already has been decided. What this judgment, when we go before the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Messiah, is what you alluded to, the judgment of rewards. He's going to look at your life, Christian. He's going to look at my life. And he's going to uh, either we're going to suffer loss. I think we'll talk more about this when we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But we are either going to suffer a loss of rewards or a reception of rewards depending upon what we have done. So what we have done, our works, do not determine where we're going to spend eternity, whether it's the kingdom of God or God forbid, the, the eternal lake of fire. Our works don't determine that. What determines that is what we do with the gospel. But having been saved, now, my works are very relevant, not for determining where I'm going to spend eternity, but determining what I'm going to receive, what type of rewards I'm going to have. And there's another scripture that points out that these rewards, what are we going to do with them? These crowns, we're going to lay them at his feet, acknowledging that these good things that we have done, it's because of him within me. He gets all the praise, all the glory. Now, we will have rewards that will also relate to our authority in the millennial kingdom. Talks about us ruling and reigning with Messiah. There's that scripture about being a good steward, that if you're faithful with a little, you're going to be faithful with much and you'll rule over much. 
So there are rewards, eternal rewards, and that's what this scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is speaking about, specifically for believers and what we're going to receive for eternity because of our faithfulness that, that uh, uh, was in, were in our deeds, but he's the cause of it. What amazing encouragement and incentive for us, isn't it? I mean, uh, wonderful news, wonderful news. Um, we'll go to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Well, once more, we see that emphasis on the living and the dead, both those who are, are spiritually secured, those who are dead spiritually. And we see that ultimately his appearing, when he's coming to establish the kingdom, and we see those two things being related at the end of the verse, his appearing, and this would be his second coming when he's coming back to Jerusalem to establish that millennial kingdom. So he's going to come for that purpose. He came the first time for an invitation and making the necessary action so that we could be in the kingdom. When he's coming the second time, he's coming to set things in order, establish that kingdom. And notice what it says. There's this, this great emphasis, I charge you, that is, I implore you, I command you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, this points out the father-son relationship, the divinity of Messiah, and that he is indeed going to be the one that acts in light of the will of his father. And that's something that, that we see over and over in the scripture. He acts, John's gospel points out during his first coming, he did the one, he did the will of the one who sent him. He did nothing on his own. He was totally submissive. He's coming back the second time. He's inheriting everything that his father has. He's inheriting it, but he's going to carry it out in a way that brings glory. This eternal son is going to bring eternal glory to his heavenly father. And that is all within the concept of the second coming and establishing his kingdom, mediating out judgment. And we haven't said it yet, but, but I'd like to point out that judgment has two aspects. Judgments have that condemnation and also the vindication. And there's the dichotomy. For those who have accepted the gospel, his judgment is going to be a source of vindication. We are going to be made to stand. We're going to experience that victory, that deliverance. So that's why in the book of Revelation, for many reasons, the heavenly hosts, the angels, the elders, they all rejoice and praise God for his judgment. But for those who have rejected the plan of salvation, God's provision, that judgment is going to be administered to them in the form of condemnation, eternal condemnation. So one judgment, but, but two sides of the coins, condemnation and vindication. Wonderful. Thank you. One of the things that uh, some people have been raising, and to be honest with you, it, um, it was very much in my wife's heart, was to talk and look at scriptures in relation to the threshing floor. So we're looking at here at Matthew 3, uh, verses 11 to 13. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan and his, in his hand is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out the threshing, his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Uh, obviously, this is uh, John the Baptist uh, speaking about Yeshua, but if you can just talk to us about the importance of this scripture and in relation to the threshing floor as well and what that means. Well, the most famous 
place of threshing, the most glorious threshing floor is the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. And it's so significant that where the temple of God stood and where it will stand again, it's a threshing floor. Why is that? Well, threshing involves separation. There's an act which is done in order that the, the grain, that kernel that is, is good, useful, pleasing, that what was desired can be received. And the, the chaff can be done away with. So God's judgment and, and your wife, Margarita, she's right. This is a very important part of judgment and relating. And, and something that oftentimes we forget about is that when Messiah returns, we all know the passage, he's going to separate the sheep and the goats. So God's judgment does have that threshing aspect of separation. In regard to the Temple Mount, David purchased a threshing floor for worship. Worship does that. There are things in my life that, that God's not pleased with. And it's through worship. Worship oftentimes brings revelation. You come into God's presence, and there's also going to be the giving of his perspective. His presence, being in his presence, gives us a different perspective. So worship shows me the things in my life that, that I need to separate from, that I need to get rid of, that's not pleasing to him. And, and this threshing, part of it is a, a beating that's going to, to separate so that, as it says here, that chaff, that which is not useful, that which is not nourishing, that which does not produce anything can be carried away and, and burnt up. And we know that God's judgment, where his first judgment in the days of Noah upon this world was in water, he promised never to, many people think, judge the world again. That's not what he says. He promises not to judge the world with water. In the last days, in the end times, he's going to judge the world with fire. And this talks about not just destruction, but this fire has to do with refining. So there's going to be a separation and, and one is going to be eternally destroyed. The other is going to be refined for eternity. So this threshing has this, this dualistic, this separation implying two groups. And that's exactly why we have that condemnation for one, vindication for other. Threshing just, just is another way of pointing out these, these two aspects, this separation that's going to occur by means of the judgment of Messiah. Baruch, thank you for that. I also have people asking me, uh, I'm a believer that we're entering into the last days. Once again, you and I agree, we never set a day or, uh, you know, only the Lord knows that. But I certainly believe that we're entering the last days. Is this something, in your opinion, that the Lord is doing now with the church or the body of Christ, a separation, or you don't see that yet? No, I, I, I strongly see that. In fact, one of the things that, that, that gives me the, the belief that we are approaching. Now, God can speed things up. He can slow things down. Sure. We don't know if we're speaking about a few more years before we reach into that, that pivotal time of Daniel's 70th week. We know we're not there yet in Daniel's 70th week because there's not a temple in, in Jerusalem. But we are seeing things, a, a falling away, an apostasy, a moving away from sound doctrine. And, and I, I strongly believe that all these things are laying the foundation that's going to, to create the situation for these last day events to, to begin, first of all, with these birth pains. I think we're getting very close. Here again, is this five years? Is it 20 years? I, I don't know. But we are, we are moving towards, I think we've talked about this, mm -hmm. that, that things are converging into things that we see prophetically, a, a characteristic of the world, a mindset of the world that, that makes it ripe for God's judgment. And his judgment, it comes to an end. This, this period comes to an end with his judgment, but there's going to be a manifestation of why 
his judgment is righteous, why it is holy, proper for him to judge the world. So this darkness, this evil is being manifested. And we're seeing this, in my opinion, in a very unique way, mm. a very, not just ungodliness, but a, a, I don't know if you would agree with this, but it's bordering on a blatant hatred for the things of God, not for religious things, but for religious truth. Truth is under attack and, and so much of Christianity is confused about what is right, what is truth. They're embracing things that, that are, are displeasing to God and even an abomination to God. Correct. I mean, even um, a day or two ago in Congress, uh, someone who called himself a Christian minister, um, you know, horrible blasphemy, uh, you know, praying to, uh, I believe he was a Hindu four-headed God, um, and then finished with a man, a woman. Uh, I mean, that showed the ignorance that, um, you know, he, he was thinking that a man had some sort of gender equality to it. Um, and that's why he added a woman. But regardless, I mean, it's not hidden anymore. It's just so much in the open, the, the blasphemy and the demonic that I agree with you 100%. This, things are speeding up very, very quickly. Well, I, I don't know if this, uh, who you necessarily were, were referring to, but um, in, in America, you're in Australia, I'm in Israel, but we, we watch the international news. And one of the newly elected senators in a runoff election in, in Georgia, you know, when you think of Georgia, you think of the Bible Belt. Mm -hmm. You think right. of a strong uh, uh, place for, Worshiping biblical appreciation, uh, Christian faith and such. Mm -hmm. And then the, one of the individuals that was elected there, he's a Baptist minister. Mm -hmm. and, and he aligns himself with an anti-Semite, Louis Farrakhan. He has, has said that certain messages that other people have spoken that are blasphemous. He says, these are some of the greatest messages. He is so far removed from a biblically fit individual to be called a, a pastor, to be a representative of God. And, and the state of Georgia affirmed him. I mean, what's interesting is that you always hear the liberals <laughs> saying, oh, we, we want a separation between the church and the state. That means for their standpoint, we don't want any religious things, any biblical things in regard to our government. When but when you have a, a pastor who is ungodly in his views, there is no problem. They embrace and the media loved him, the, the national media in America. They gave him so much more airtime and such than the other. Why? Because he Although he came with a religious uh, covering, so to speak, he was about as ungodly and unscriptural as you can get. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we're seeing much, much more of that everywhere. The next scripture we want to look at is uh, John 16, verse 33. Uh, These things I have spoken to you, that in, in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And just before I hand over to you, Baruch, I mean... And once again, please correct me if I'm wrong, but does the word tribulation here may also refer to a threshing? Uh, related. Uh, I don't think they're one and the same, sure. but there is an aspect. We, we talked about that, that threshing involves a, a beating. Mm -hmm. and that beating brings about the separation. There is no question in my mind that yep. God's going to use tribulation in order to separate, right. to manifest. And, and what I mean by that is we all know the scripture that talks about individuals being weighed down with the cares of life. We know the parable of the sower and there's other parables that Messiah speaks about that shows just because someone says, Lord, Lord, mm -hmm. just because someone says, oh, I'm a believer, that doesn't necessarily mean that what they say 
is true, that they have believed in their heart that, that who Messiah is and that he's been risen from the dead and such. John, for example, in 1 John speaks about they went out from us mm -hmm. because they never belong to us. They weren't part of, of the believers. And, and so there's going to be tribulation used by God. He's not necessarily the source of it, but he can use whatever. He's going to use tribulation because there's many people when they are threatened with, with persecution for righteousness, they're going to say, I never signed up to suffer. I never agree to, to going through tribulation. And, and that tribulation is going to be an instrument that God uses to separate. So that's certainly part of the threshing uh, 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 process. So the beating is the tribulation. Right. And, and, and it's a great point you touched on as well, because that would apply to some of these false teachings and doctrines like the prosperity uh, gospel that... Um, and please note that I am a firm believer that, you know, the Lord, you know, he is the good shepherd and, and he looks after our needs and not necessarily sometimes what we want, but definitely our needs. But, you know, the prosperity gospel focuses just on here and now. I've heard some preachers I mean, directed from the mouth saying, um, I'm not going to go to heaven being poor, um, which is so ridiculous. I mean, you can't take anything with you, but, um, those are the types of teachings that aren't equipping and preparing the body of Christ for the days to come, correct? No, I, I agree with you. They're not preparing people. God's principles can produce prosperity. Mm -hmm. God's principles can teach us how to make decisions that will, will, will produce blessings, even financial blessings. I, I, don't, I don't doubt that. Mm -hmm. But having prosperity earthly prosperity is no it's not necessarily an indicator of one's spiritual spiritual growth or lack thereof there's a lot of people who have prosperity that have no spiritual growth correct so so it's it's a shame today that there is so much false teaching and emphasizing the things of this world rather than the the things of of god here again tribulation a scripture that I keep going back to is, is Acts 14, 22. And, and here, the, the author of, of Acts, presumably Luke, he, he says that it's necessary to, to go through much tribulation to enter into the kingdom of God. And we always need to make, and we've done this in an earlier uh, conversation that we had a few weeks ago, we always need to make a distinction between tribulation and the wrath of God. In fact, I, I believe in, in one of the passages that, that is mentioned, tribulation, it speaks about suffering for righteousness. That is a form of tribulation. And oftentimes, the main aspect of tribulation for a believer, it's going to be our righteous decisions, our desire to walk with God that's going to bring tribulation into our life. And, and God says, rejoice in that. Be, be glad in that. So we are called to encounter tribulation in this world. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, the last scripture I want to touch on in, in regards to whether it be direct or a correlation, correlation with threshing floor is Hebrews 12, verse 26 to 29, which says, whose voice then shook the earth, but now... He has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates that the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Just before I hand over to you for your comments and teaching on Hebrews on that scripture, Baruch, I think one thing that stands out about not only, not only the shaking, but that, that we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. I think that is seriously lacking in many parts around the world. Um, I see many times people coming out on, a church altar 
or a stage. It's really a stage with rigged jeans, t-shirts. Um, you know, they're trying to be trendy and and they say they're bringing in the, the young crowd. But I see that as disrespectful. I don't see that as reverence and a godly fear. Yes, the God looks God looks at your heart and you don't have to be rich to be wearing $10,000 suits. But I always think give God your best. If uh, people that are being married, you'll understand that, you know, when you go and get married, you put on your best. Even if you go to a job interview, you put on your best. You don't have to be rich, but you still put on your best. And that's reverence. And I think that's lacking severely these days. And especially that godly fear. I mean, we see it all around the world. But if you can just touch on that, Baruch, that'll be really appreciated. Well, I, I concur. Here again, it's not about the value of clothes. No, correct. But it's about the heart condition where I want to come in a way that honors. You mentioned a job interview. You, you go there so the person can see, I, I have dressed in order to, to honor this this privilege I have of being given an interview, being given perhaps an opportunity to the Hebrew word parnasah, such a rich word, to, to, to earn provision, sustenance, you know, uh, having the provision for, for my family. That's a privilege, uh, not to go off on a tangent, but, but I don't believe that, that today people are honoring those individuals that take the risk that work hard in order to build a business that gives other individuals a livelihood. Right. That's such a important thing. And, and I know many people who have run small businesses and such, and they're so concerned. They're more concerned with being able to, to make the payroll for their employees than what they're going to, to earn. And, and we, we, we ignore that. But getting back to, to this, it's about honoring God, coming before him in a way that says, you know what, I've given thought to the fact that, that in worship, I'm coming into the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And I want to show that there is a difference between this world and the kingdom of God. The problem is that in so many places, they are bringing a nightclub environment in the name of trying to attract people and they want to use smoke and all mm -hmm. this lighting. And I can tell you that uh, in some of the networks that we use, they have, have, have requested that we change our presentation with, with massive lights and all of these things. And, and I said, well, what does that have to do with the message that's going for? Well, it doesn't, it's just a presentation that's more pleasing to the people. Well, I don't think that we should have a presentation that's trying to be pleasing to people, but, but pleasing and showing reverence and respect to God. I think that's what, what you're getting at. Going back to, to the passage at hand, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, the shaking, the scripture that comes into our my, my mind is twice it mentions in the prophecy of Haggai that God is going to shake the heavens and the earth. Yeah. And this shaking of the heavens and earth, heavens and earth, when we hear those phrases together, we should think of creation because it says in the beginning that Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemaim vet It's in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So heavens and earth creation. When it says God's going to shake heavens and earth, there's going to be a new creation. And he's speaking here about the kingdom of God. So once again, God is going to make a, a decision, a righteous decision on what's going to be this shaking implies an overturning, a transformation, a dealing with. So again, there's a, a, a hint of this concept of threshing because threshing speaks of separation. God's going to see those things both in this world and in the world up above the spiritual world. What is he keeping? What is he not? What is he receiving? What is he rejecting? What is going to be pure and refined? What is going to be condemned and destroyed? So all of this is at the heart of what God's doing. And I like that you put an emphasis on the end of it, 
and that is what may be your translation says uh, acceptable. Yes. Normally, that word is a word that takes, it's actually two Greek words. It's a word for pleasing. So there's, there's a big difference as, as you as uh, uh, a business owner, if I'm working for you, you know, are you happy with work that's just acceptable or is it better that the work that someone does is well-pleasing to you? Absolutely. Would you see a difference in those Absolutely. terms? Absolutely, yes. And, and this word implies that, that which is pleasing and then it has a prefix for the word good in front of it. So it's pleasing because it's good. And as I, I frequently say, the word good always relates to the will of God. So what Messiah is going to do, he's going to shake and bring change, a separation, a threshing, in order that what remains is pleasing to God, well-pleasing to him because it fulfills his objectives. It goes back to this idea that we talked about earlier with the word orizo, setting things in a way that fulfills a standard. That's what God's going to do. So as, as his servants, as his disciples, if someone is, we're going to have that same desire. We're going to be interested in those standards. We're not going to want to compromise and reflect the world. What does the world and the way the world thinks have to do with worshiping God? Mm. So this whole thing about, oh, let's be hip. Let's be, I think the word that you use, trendy, mm -hmm. very, very good word. That's what they're trying to be, trendy in what's popular in the world, thinking that the world ways will capture people. Well, let me tell you, those churches that use such a methodology, they're capturing people, capturing people by the ways of the world. And those, those people are going to experience the ways of the world mm -hmm. because they're not getting biblical truth. There is not that what's mentioned, not just well-pleasing, but the next word, reverence don't Correct. you think that's a word that's really missing yes in, in our vocabulary today yes, absolutely what is reverent and that has to do with the fear of the lord a godly fear to to do that which fulfills his expectations and and i'll close with this but but my problem when i look at myself and others and 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 such is that all too often, and this is the deceit of the enemy, he gets me to think how I want God to bless my objectives. That's wrong. We need to be people that want to live in a way that fulfills his objectives. Mm -hmm. So it's a, excuse me, a totally change in mentality. And, and that's what this scripture is speaking about. God's going to shake. He's going to change the world into that which is well-pleasing to God and fulfills his standards, his objectives, not the objectives of the world. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that. We're going into a couple of scriptures that um, sometimes people don't want to really pay a lot of attention to, sadly, but basically where we're looking at that the judgment begins in the house of God. So in 1 Peter 4, 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Just before I hand over to you, Baruch, I think we've, we've already touched on this a little bit, but this is not to bring conviction to any of believers that is watching this program. Uh, sorry, condemnation. It's not to bring condemnation but we're praying that the Holy Spirit will convict people. We all have work to do. Uh, none of us are there yet, but I think it's very important for us to look at these next couple of scriptures where God is very clear and very adamant that judgment begins in the house of God. Over to you, Brooke. The context for the house of God, we could understand that as the people of God, his covenant people. So God is going to, and the scripture that, that we're going to go to in a moment also relates to this. I like the way it was, was put together, because if you look at the context of, of 1 Peter chapter 4, 
in this, these latter verses, it deals with something we mentioned earlier, and that is suffering for righteousness. Correct. Secondly, God is also going to bring uh, a degree of discipline, his, his chastening, his punishment upon us for not meeting his objectives. Now, if God to those who are loving him, those who have entered into a covenant with him, if we are going to receive the, the discipline and perhaps severe discipline of the Lord, what does the scripture say? Whom the Lord loves, he, he chastens, he disciplines. If God is faithful to say to his covenant people, both Old and New Testament covenant people, if, if he punishes us for disobedience, then we come to the last part, how much more so is the implication will be the end, the outcome for those who do not. And notice this. Now he's talking about judgment and condemnation, not, not punishment in the sense of discipline, but condemnation. And notice what he says here. What is going to be the source of this eternal condemnation? One thing, not I didn't do enough good works. I didn't do this. I didn't No. What does it say? those who did not obey the gospel. And this really comes to the heart of, of what love Israel is all about. Mm -hmm. And that is we are gospel centered. We want people to hear that message of, of God's true love, how God manifested his love by sending his son to the cross, paying the price for, for your sins and my sins in order that we could, could find that good news of salvation, salvation through faith in the grace of God. In that earlier scripture, it mentions the grace of God in relationship to serving him. So in this scripture, in 1 Peter chapter 4, there's going to be a discipline for those who have received the grace, but who are not being faithful in serving God, letting grace work itself out and bringing a, a righteous obedience, when we hinder that, there's going to be a punishment, a discipline. But, but how much more so are those who have rejected God's free gift, mm -hmm. ignored what Messiah did upon the cross? And, and I'll say this, to me, it goes hand in hand with a lessening of preaching the cross. It goes hand in hand with ignoring the judgment of God. And those two things are, are greatly related. We know God judges sin because of the cross. Thank you. The, one of the final scriptures we'll look at is in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, verses 11 to 15. For no other foundation can anyone lay than which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. The reason why I mentioned I liked these two scriptures side by side is because when we look at the end of the previous verse from 1 Peter 4, those who did not obey the gospel, it deals with the judgment of where you're going to be spending eternity in the kingdom of heaven or in the lake that burns with fire. Now we're talking about the same concept judgment, but in a very different way. This has nothing, this scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is not speaking about where we're going to spend eternity, but it speaks about, as it says at the end of the verse, rewards. Yes. And, and I've heard someone say, because of the concept suffering loss, you, you can't suffer a loss if you didn't have it. And, and some theologians teach that, that God he has a plan. This is true. I don't think anyone would disagree with this, but he has a plan for every person. 
And, and with that plan, if, if a person were to follow it, there's rewards. Scripture speaks about this. And those rewards are already created. That shows the sincerity and the ability of God to, to honor that, that commitment. When we go before that judgment seat of Christ for, for judgment of our life, here again, not talking about where we're going to spend eternity, but what rewards are we going to have? If we built our life upon the proper foundation, Messiah, Yeshua, Christ Jesus, his word, his truth. If we build upon that, when that fire comes, it's going to refine. And, and in the end, these rewards that we're going to receive are those that are kingdom refined. They, they have been made perfect for us. But if we built upon the wrong foundation, our own desires, my own mindset, my pride, my selfishness, my greed, if, if these were uh, indicators of my life on how I lived, then that, that evaluation of fire is not going to have a refining effect. Mm -hmm. It's going to have a destroying, just like if you cast hay or or stubble into fire it's consumed and it's gone nothing's there so this deals with a very important principle for the believer and this verse is speaking to the believer are we living in a way are we building our life upon a foundation that we're going to have precious rewards those things that he speaks about here uh, uh, gold, silver, and precious stones? Or are we making decisions and building our life that in actuality, when, when God evaluates them, puts that fire to the test, they're going to be like wood, hay, and straw that are consumed and no more. So it really challenges myself, challenges you, Christian, challenges every believer. What, what is our decision for Christ? going to produce when i go before the judgment seat of messiah to show what my life my faith in him has produced is my whole life going to be just rendered to nothing in the sense i have nothing to show for my so-called faith or is my faith going to produce those things that are precious stones and silver and gold those things that that reflect reflect that which is of worth many people are not living in a way that shows a worth their life's not having a worth from god's judging standpoint how he evaluates one's life all right thank you very much the scripture that we're going to finish with uh, a lot of people know this scripture of course it's great news it's a great news scripture john 6 verse 37 all that the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. So just before I uh, hand over to you, Brooke, uh, we've, we've touched on that very powerful and good news scripture that we just spoke about in John 6, 3, 7. I think that like I touched on earlier, this is not to bring condemnation. This is to bring conviction. This is to equip and prepare the body of Christ, the church for his coming. Uh, it's with love that we do this, that we share these very important scriptures. Uh, to me, the whole Bible is important. It's there for a reason, every single word. But these are just some scriptures only. It's not all of them, especially in the New Testament that talks about Messiah as a judge. So, but the good news is that he says to us clearly here, and who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. So before I hand over to Baruch for some closing comments, I just want to encourage you. This is more of an encouragement to draw closer to Messiah. He will not cast you out. Abide in him. We've said this before in other uh, teachings. Spend time in the word. Wait and on the guidance and the counsel of the Holy Spirit. Uh, align yourself. If you're going to a church, make sure it's a church that's teaching the word of God that's talking and preaching and teaching on repentance, the importance of the cross, Yeshua as judge and his second coming, which is not far off. So we encourage you, please do so. 
And over to you now, Baruch, for some closing comments, please. Well, this verse is, is a verse that comes with a lot of theological baggage. Uh, there are some that want to interpret this in the following way. All, meaning people, that, that the Father gives me. And some people see this as a, a election passage, which means that, that God has just chosen chosen in a vacuum according to whatever he's sovereign he'll choose whoever he wants and he gives them to messiah and it's that giving that makes them believers and such but but i see it very very differently when it says all that the father gives me i don't see this giving in a vacuum simply god's choice and that's it in the same way that if if i were to come and to work for you, Christian, in your, in your business, I would expect you know, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, however, that you would give me a paycheck, correct? correct. But, but that giving of the paycheck is, is not based simply because I'm an employee, but with that employment comes a, an expectation of what I'm going to be doing. So that, that remuneration, that pay, comes from the fact that that I did the certain things. And in the same way, when it says, my father gives me, there's a, a, a cause for being given. And that's what we, we've talked about so much. It's the gospel. It's a free gift. It, it's not based upon works. It's not based upon something that I do in, in the flesh, some deed or what. So when it says, all that the Father gives me, we need to remember there's a way that the Father gives to the Son. And that way is through the gospel. And that's an important thing. Those who the Father has sanctioned by means of the gospel, they will come to Messiah. That's what the gospel does. The gospel gives us in truth that shows here's God's provision. Here's the one that he sent to be savior. So we see that those individuals following God's methodology, God's mechanism, they come to Messiah. And the one who comes to me, here's the assurance. He says, I will by no means, very important phrase, I will by no means cast out. And, and this is a, a strong, strong statement of, assurance that we should have so i would just say this that god gives people to his son eternally through a covenant and that new covenant is established by means of faith in the work of messiah in other words through the gospel I remember I've shared this many times but when when we first moved to israel and it's hard to believe that it's been over 19 years ago that we, we moved to Israel. I remember maybe after a year or two, my son came home and in his school, he would have vocabulary words. Now this wasn't to teach him Hebrew. These were Hebrew words that, that had great significance for, for the purpose of Judaism. And one of the words was besorah, which is the word gospel. Many people think that's a New Testament word that, that it didn't exist, but we see it in the prophecy of Isaiah. And, and Bissora, they would give you the definition. You had to learn the word and what it meant. So they gave the, the children the definition. And I'll never forget, it even said it. Chadashot tovot al ha hasofit, which means it's the good news about the final redemption. And that final redemption is a kingdom redemption. Good news. And this is what we see here, that God in grace, God in mercy, he has provided the means where we can find redemption. Redemption is related to forgiveness so that we can experience eternity with him in a kingdom. But this verse does not speak simply about God in a vacuum, electing people with no thoughts other than, well, this is who God has chosen. 
I don't see that in, in John chapter 6, verse 37, especially with the, with the context that surrounds that. Because if you remember John chapter 6, it's that difficult teaching about one who has to be dependent upon Messiah. Trust him. And it's that, that passage that says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, speaking about his, his death, the shedding of his blood, making redemption, and, and here again, people don't do the necessary work because that word for eat is not the normal word estheo for just having a meal. It's usually used in regard to animals and animals eat for a different reason. You know, you and I, Christian, we go, oh, it's lunchtime, let's eat. Oh, it's dinner time, let's eat. We eat by timing, we eat by social reasons and such. Animals eat out of a dependency to survive. And what Messiah was saying is, if we don't receive his provision, we won't survive. We are absolutely dependent upon what he's done. So a very important chapter for understanding the context of John, 3, 6, John 6, verse 37. Amen. Thank you very much for that. Well, for everyone watching this program, we hope you've been blessed by today's teaching. I certainly have. I thank you, Baruch. Um, I want to also just a very quick notice to uh, all the Spanish speaking people watching the program. Love Israel will have a conference in Spanish on the 17th of January. You can go to Amaras Israel, the website, or loveisrael.org. We encourage you, all Spanish speaking people, please to attend. You will certainly be blessed. Uh, if you need more information on the ministry Love Israel, please, of course, we invite you to go to the website, loveisrael.org. If you haven't subscribed already to the YouTube channel, please do so. I've said this many occasions. There's an enormous amount of biblical teaching material available to you. It's wonderful teachings. You will be blessed. And once again, Baruch, I'd like to thank you so much for this teaching. It's a very important topic that needs to be taught. I think that I've certainly been blessed by the teaching today. And it certainly has convicted me in, in many areas. And I pray that it's done the same to everyone else. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Christian, for putting it together and uh, uh, selecting the scriptures and really leading the, the discussion and, and all. I'd like to say one personal note, just not of appreciation to you, but, but thank you for mentioning the Spanish conference. And if I'm not mistaken, right, you can, can hear this in Spanish and you don't need any translations because Correct. Correct. Your, 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 your language is also, although you speak English yeah. uh, like an Australian, you, you also speak Spanish. So. Yes, no, no, we're, we're certainly going to be uh, uh, looking at it. And that's why I encourage everyone to speak Spanish all over the world. Please join us for the conference. You will certainly be blessed. So thank you, Baruch, once again. I look forward to another discussion very soon, God willing. And uh, thank you to everyone watching this program. We pray you've been blessed. You will have the opportunity to send us comments or questions. We'll uh, notify at the end of this teaching where you can write us to. We've already received some very positive comments and emails and we're very grateful for that and uh, from myself christian in australia team shalom and thank you